Phil, you've written this book. Um, what's the premise that you're trying to convey <laughs> from your experience in the Department of Homeland Security? The title is See Something, Say Nothing. It's based on the saying from the Department of Homeland Security, if you see something, say something, except that they never tell us what to see and they don't tell us what to say. And the book is a story of what happened when I did attempt to warn the U.S. government vis-a-vis -vis the counterterrorism policy that individuals and organizations that they're forming alliances with are an open threat to our constitutional form of government. <laughs> Um, have you faced criticism that uh, that, that in, in trying to uh, uh, limit um, Muslim immigration to America, that it's uh, a part of a racist and, and, and taboo uh, 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 attitude and philosophy which doesn't belong in American government? Well, I was investigated nine times, but it wasn't for my at my opinions about immigration. This started well before the immigration policy ever emerged. It had to do primarily with the identifying, identification of major global level Islamic groups like the Muslim Brotherhood and Tablighi Jamaat in particular. And those two groups, the government insists to this day, have no bearing and are not a, don't pose any threat to Americans, which is not true. Is there an agenda within the Democrat administration to bring Muslims into America that could be absorbed into Muslim uh, Arab countries? Well, there's a definite, deliberate, and intentional policy that they have to bring individuals into the country, despite repeated warnings from various sectors of the law enforcement community that we can't thoroughly or adequately vet these individuals. They're not even taking advice from their own highly placed uh, officials within the government, FBI, CIA, even Department of State, any law enforcement agency. They say we cannot thoroughly and adequately vet these individuals and guarantee the American public that we're safe. Do you feel that there's an agenda to bring Muslims in for a particular agenda? I think it's part of a larger agenda that you can find right in the Declaration of Independence. That is, to alter or abolish this form, current form of government. And it appears by their actions that this administration and the progressive leftist Democratic Party are attempting to alter or abolish, aka hope and change, this current form of government and replace it with one that is more inclusive and diverse and less discriminate, discriminatory than the one that we have now. They state that plainly. What do you feel, uh, the gentlemen who are uh, uh, members of uh, an ethnic minority and have been ethnic minorities in Arab, uh, in Arab country, uh, like Egypt, uh, do you feel that there's a discriminatory policy in, in the United States towards uh, Arabs in general? I, I cannot say for, for sure that there is discrimination. Dis, discrimination. Is, is it a government policy that's Well, it's, I, I would say Obama's policy, not the whole government. I, I believe Obama is the one, uh, he's, he's changing the policy and even he doesn't want to mention the word in the whole government, uh, the word Islamic terrorist, he doesn't want to mention that. And he hired a lot of Muslim in his organization, in the White House and in, in other, even Homeland Security. And, and I don't know if we've vetting them or not, or vetted them or not. I mean, like care organization. Care organization, this is part of the Muslim Brotherhood. You mean, uh, what does care stand for? Uh, Council on American yeah, Islamic Relations. Yeah. And, and Egypt themselves now, they said that the Brotherhood is a terrorist organization. United States here, they don't want to say that. And care organization, or the, the official of the care organization, usually go to the White House anytime they want. And still Obama meeting with them and listening to them and taking their advice. And Obama himself, if they put the Muslim Brotherhood, President Morsi, he put him in power in Egypt because of Obama. I mean, 
uh, Ahmed Shafi was running against Morsi, he won. But United States called, if you remember, the, the, the military was taking care of Egypt, was temporarily until they put a president. So they were the, like the president. And United States called Tantawi, who was the head of the government, uh, the, the military, and told him, put Morsi in the government uh, as the president. And he put him in the president, as a president. When the CC took him out of, the, of his position, they said this is a coup. And it wasn't a coup. 33 million people went to the street to demand that he gets out. And took like almost a year and a half or two years until the United States accepted that it's not a coup. Uh, doctor, would you explain, um, as a, a, Egyptians, how, how are you uh, uh, Arab but different than the uh, immigrants that might be coming from Egypt today? <clears throat> well, I think things have changed over the last few generations. In our days, we did not think of these divisions, and we were living in a semi-democratic condition. Though we had a ruler that you can call him autocratic, Nasser, but he was a very good man, a fair man, maybe not good for Israel, but was good for the people in the country. We, didn't, we never felt the difference between a Muslim and a Christian at the time, never been pointed out to us. However, we were aware that we are cops, means we are really from the original Egyptian stock. We belong to the days of the pharaohs. So we haven't changed any religion, we kept to that. And uh, Muslims could be, a, part, part of them could be originally from Arabia, or some of them who are copt, converted to Islam. But these were good days. After the 60s, started things to change. And I think the change that happened in Egypt started with somebody that America likes because America has some tendency to like personalities and like people who may be actors. That was Sadat. Sadat was a great actor and he destroyed Egypt inside because he revived the Muslim brother. He made them take rules with him. He adored them and he started persecuting the Christians. And what happened is the Muslim brother got the power and they killed him. It's an amazing how it is. You, it's like you let the snake come in and bite you. And then what happened was, uh, from there on, there have been a change in Egypt. There have been the rise of all Islamic fanatism. Now, if it has tendency in the beginning to have something to do with political views, but I think it became more and more fanatic against Christians in Egypt. Now, in the, uh, in the outside scene, they want to have to regain some power and to have to stand in the world as a power. They were rich, they have been <coughs> most, always calling for terrorists, but somehow they were able to get into America and the government of uh, America. Well, how did this happen? It's a puzzlement to me. Now, I'm not going to blame only Obama. I go all the way to Bush. That Bush has to go in the Middle East, I am against it, I was against it. I believe it was the biggest mistake America made. We didn't need to go to Iraq because there were two factions, <coughs> which is the Sunni and the Shia. We never felt there is anything like this before. But now it came to the for forefront and became a big war between themselves. And we got something so strange. We do the opposite. i tell you why. We are going to Iraq, which essentially helped us against the Shia, which is Iran. They fought Iran for us. And now we go to get the guy that fought Iran for us so we can let the Shia of Iran become stronger. And, I, and that's the outcome. We are doing the same thing with the Islamist, And started by the policy of, uh, what's her name, Hillary. Hillary supported the Muslim <coughs> brothers in Egypt and brought, as you mentioned, my friend here mentioned to you, brought that Morsi in. And the people knew that this is not what Egypt wants. Egypt was uh, relatively a good country in the past. We had freedom. Now it became all Islamist and start the persecution. And why are they helping Islamists? I have no idea. 
Why would they come? So you have this, uh, this, this dilemma to me. Look again. Why do we go to, to, uh, to uh, Benghazi? And look what happened. We got hurt. We tried to help Benghazi. Every time to go in this area, we are the one going to get hurt. And so I see a strange policy. I'm not able to, to understand. We come now to the immigration. We should be able to solve this problem locally. We should be able to keep these people and get them place until the problem between Syria and the fighting in Syria could come to an end, and they stay in their own country. We get back to the normal routine where we accepted people, immigrants from all the countries as America is, and accept them after we vet them. We know the same way I came. I have to apply, I have to go through the process, I have to wait, everybody should be the same. We cannot accept this dangerous flux of people that we don't know who they are. I give you a little summary. I'm sorry that I took a little amount of time. So I want to I add to what Trump said about he, I mean, they, they change what he said about we're not going to accept anybody from a Muslim country. They, they, they did not, he did not mean exactly that. <coughs> he meant that we have to vet them before we accept them. But how can they be vetted if they're coming from Syria, with, from Aleppo, which has been all decimated, Phil? Well, first of all, we don't even really know if they're only coming from Syria. That's right. We, the whole narrative is incomplete. The story that we hear in the media in generic terms that they're coming from Syria isn't even really accurate. We don't actually know where they're truly coming from. And as my colleague, my friend said, Mr. Trump did not say we should never accept immigrants. He simply said let's fix a system that's broken. Our country has a long history of accepting immigrants, but we always followed a procedure to do it. We don't need to sacrifice the well-being and safety of American citizens to bring immigrants in when we can't identify who they really are. Mm -hmm. That's what Department of Homeland Security was technically created to do, to protect American citizens, citizens from threat, both foreign and domestic. And going back to the Muslim Brotherhood references, that's exactly the reason why I came into a confrontational relationship with my own government. Because I kept telling them over and over, every possible way that I could, these people are not our friends. They are not moderate and they are not seeking our benefit. They have their own Sharia agenda and they will use a variety of tactics to accomplish their stated purpose, which is implementation <coughs> of Sharia law. And do you believe that the government doesn't know that? I'm sure they do know it, which is a whole other moral dimension of the <coughs> problem. Because after November of 2008, when the Department of Justice concluded the Holy Land Foundation trial, and convicted five individuals on 102 counts of support of Hamas, they knew from that point forward that these individuals and organizations were irrefutably tied to the support of a globally designated terrorist organization. I'm talking about the Muslim Brotherhood and the front groups like Council <coughs> on American Islamic Relations, Islamic Society of North America, North American Islamic Trust, Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, and many other ones who, by the way, in cumulative total, have met with the Obama administration in the White House, I documented at least 150 times, with knowing who these groups actually are as proven in federal court. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Mr. Gobriel, would you consider uh, that uh, Phil is prejudiced, that he has some uh, uh, racism in his uh, concern about bringing uh, no. Arab Muslims in? No, no, I have the same concern. I mean, we have to vet, I mean, even, even if you ask some Muslim people here in the United States, they feel the same thing. They said we should vet them. I mean, not just anybody come here and <coughs> they, they do so, something uh, crazy thing here in, and, and they're going to get blamed for it. The, 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 the good Muslim here in the United States, they're going to get blamed for any action done by the crazy, crazy uh, Muslim guy that who wants to hurt us here in the West. Do you feel that a care is looking to exploit this in some way? Yes, yes. 
Okay. Yes, and care should list them as uh, terrorist organization. But United States, because Obama doesn't want to do that. Egypt already did that. I mean that, that I mean the brotherhood, the, 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 brotherhood, the brotherhood in Egypt as a terrorist organization. And so how would you envision this would change <clears throat> under either a, a, a new Republican administration it's gonna or, change. or a Democrat administration? No, and re Republican. If, if the United States will elect Hillary Clinton, she, we're going to have the third term of Obama. And she said that. The same thing, in other words? In, in yes, same, same policy of Obama. Really? Yes. yes. And with the same pro-Muslim, uh, 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 pro-Islamist tolerance for Islamism? Muslim Brotherhood and and immigration. You mean the the, the, the Hillary or, or uh, Hillary. Uh, Hillary? Oh yes, yeah, she's going to follow the same thing. She's going to follow the same, and she's going to accept even more. Uh, yeah, let me interject here. Yeah. You know that she still have her advisor. <clears throat> is a woman who is from the Muslim brother. Yes. And her parents were active in the Muslim brother. These are no. Yes. So she hasn't changed. Mm. And she's the one that visited uh, Egypt in the time when they were trying to get the Muslim brothers to take over. She's the one that met them. Mm. And she would meet with nobody else. She decided this is a group that America wants to deal with. Well, who so are you referring to? I'm with the Muslim Hillary. brother. Hillary. Hillary. Absolutely. Hillary. She was a Secretary <laughs> of State that was very instrumental in this whole policy. So it's not, this policy is not going to change. Now, you ask a question which is a very intelligent question and has been answered partially here. At the question, does the government know that or not? Now, I have a, a, some conflicting thoughts about this. Let me tell you. When Bush stood up <coughs> after we were attacked in 9-11 by 19 Muslim people, yes. there were no Christian among them. There was no Jew among them. They were all Muslim, from mostly from Saudi Arabia. Nineteen of them shook us and brought us to our knees. Don't forget that. We did. America for the first time, the proud America. Bush stands there and say, Islam is a religion of peace. How stupid could he be? Did he read about this Islam? Did he study history of Islam? And we have him as a president, and he has uttered these words. <coughs> now, I have a thought about this. When Reagan had the uh, Marine in Lebanon, and they were attacked, 200 or more Marines yes, were killed. Yes. What year was that? 19? That was in the, in the 80s. 89? 80, 80, 80s, I don't know. In the 80s. In the 80s. Maybe. Uh -huh. I can't, I'm not, <coughs> okay. I can't remember the dates exactly. I wish I do have that memory. But... I remember the incident. He had in his, ad, the people that advise him, he used to rely on them. There was a guy from Lebanon, his name is Habib. Yes. He told him, get out of this place. Why do you sit there? And he was smart. He moved out. He was not a loser by doing this, he was smart. He didn't want to get involved <coughs> in a long-standing war. And then Bush say, I'm going to be like Reagan. He was anti-Reagan. He goes into the area where there's more trouble in it. There was, I, uh, sorry to say, I had a son. I have a son that, that's in the military. In which, he, which military? The US, US, US. Okay. We are, we are Americans around here. <coughs> the public? And he was both Five. in Iraq <coughs> and Afghanistan. And you know what he said? What? He said, I looked at the situation. What is bringing us here? They have their misery here. Why do you have to bring more misery to the people who have misery? I mean, this is a young guy. My son could think of this, and we have our government couldn't think of this. What are we doing there? What did we do? Why should we, America, the great America, go to have 4,000 of their soldiers killed for somebody called Saddam? He's not even worse one, one of them. And so if he thought, we need to go back to our, and I, I, I'm not for, uh, I have to tell you, I'm not for any of the two other, two are going to be elected. I am not happy with both of them. I wish that, uh, uh, of course I'm going to have to, to lean away from, uh, from Hillary. But let me tell you, there's nobody is thinking that we have to go above all these things. America has to go back, and the word greatness, it's demanded now that we should have our word 
So we don't have even to send arms. We can speak a word. And the word. we did have John Foster Dallas. We did have Eisenhower. They could say a word and they could stop a war. They didn't have to, to go to send military. We were strong that our word was stronger than our military. And it should be both strong. That's all. I have a way of illustrating it. For example, there is a mirror bill right now in the House in the Senate. SB SB 3892. What does it mean, a Miller a mirror? mirror. Bill? There's the same language in the House and in the in the Senate. Okay. It is uh, the Muslim Brotherhood terrorist designation bill, terrorist organization bill. If we were to pass that, which could theoretically be done before the election, under Congress, we would send a signal to the entire. Salafi, pro-Sharia, pro-Jihad, Islamic world that America is once again serious about protecting its borders from terrorism. We could do it without firing a single shot or dropping a single bomb anywhere in the world. That, my friend, would send a shockwave throughout the, the pro-Sharia, pro-Jihad, Islamic world. Yes. It would be very effective and it would enable us to address the threat that's right in front of us clearly defined, clearly understood by everywhere else in the world except somehow here that organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood are, are a threat to us. They're not benign nor are they moderate. They are a malevolent threat and they have a clearly stated strategic agenda and they say what they intend to do and they're making progress. One of the terms is settlement jihad. And this administration is aiding and abetting in that clearly stated tactical approach to implement what is called al mutsima al islamina al-Qaeda, the observant Muslim base. Al-Qaeda is not an organization, it's an abstract concept of a uniform community that submits to the, the concept of Sharia law and pushes it forward in whatever society they find themselves in and they're doing it right in front of us here in the United States. Is this mentality that you have, this orientation which you have, is this representative of the current um, leadership in the Department of Homeland Security and, and America's security uh, uh, institutions? No, if it were I wouldn't have been investigated nine times by my own administration not for moral failure or failure to observe, uh, follow an order but for simply putting information into the intelligence citizen, uh, system that the administration found contradictory to their narrative and that's why I was in trouble investigated so much because I declared plainly groups like Tablighi -e Jamaat and Muslim Brotherhood pose a threat to us uh -huh. and they insist that they are moderate and that they do not pose a threat that Islam is a religion of peace without ever looking or honestly evaluating what the stated strategic goal of these groups actually is. But this is very heavy stuff. You're, you're, what you're saying essentially is that the, the, the uh, U.S. institutions to protect us have been hijacked. Is that, that what you're saying? That's why I call it see something, say nothing. <clears throat> because why would they remove intelligence information out of the system then? I talk about that in the book. In 2009 this started when I was ordered specifically from headquarters in Washington to remove, the word was modify, linking information out of more than 820 intelligence records that were related directly to the Muslim Brotherhood individuals or organizations that were operating in the United States. Then they went further in 2012 and purged out all the training material related to Islam out of the Department of Defense, Department of Justice, FBI, Department of Homeland Security, and then they went one step further after that in 2012 and completely eradicated intelligence information out of the system related to the Tablighi Jamaat organization. And they didn't stop there. Then they went after the individuals who had the background and the expertise and went after their careers. What do you fear would happen if this, uh, this administrative uh, mindset were to continue through another Democrat administration? Exactly more of what we've already been seeing. 
It's like a mathematical formula. Add the variable variables and you're going to see the same result every single time. Especially when, if you view it from the lens of the global Islamic movement strategy, which is implementation of Sharia law, it all makes perfect sense. And every time they do an attack, and they're not confronted, they see it from an Islamic perspective as a mandate to go farther and push more. Mm -hmm. And they will continue. It's called the a weak response reaction. If we respond re uh, weakly, they respond even more strongly. Is How much of a risk would you say there is from a Muslims within America today? Those who are, are perceived uh, to be either secular or religious in a way that is not fundamentalist? Well, Islam without Sharia law it would be a harmless religion. The problem is Sharia. Sharia is like the specter or the cloud that comes into the community and begins to exert its influence. And Muslims are then at that point forced to make a change, a choice between the world, the, their belief and let's say the US, their citizenship in the US Constitution. They come to the point where they're forced to choose. Using Egypt as the example, Mr. Gobriel, what what do Americans have to be concerned about in this coming election season? You, you're talking about from the Muslim point of view, or, or? from from, from the, the the perspective of the condition of uh, Coptic Christian Egyptians who have uh, experienced growing uh, Islamist influence. <coughs> In, in political and social uh, society? Well, uh, that's why I'm here. I came here in 67 because this is the, the, the freedom country, the freedom you can uh, practice your religion anytime you want. That's why we came here. Most of the cops came here, which I think I would say between two to three million in all over the United States. Right now, we have two to three million. Uh, they left Egypt because of the persecution and come to the, the Judeo-Christian country <clears throat> that they can practice uh, our religion free, freely. Uh, but from, from most of the Egyptian here, they conservative in nature. We in nature, we are conservative. Even Muslim are conservative. So they're going to vote for I believe we're going to vote for a Republican, whether whether Donald Trump or somebody, if anybody else, a Republican. Because I, I am very afraid that if Hillary wins, she's going to put on the Supreme Court very liberal one. Then we lost all our freedom from religious point of freedom. We, we lost because the, the Supreme Court will be more liberal than than conservative. Are you concerned that the Supreme Court might make criticism of Islam illegal as it's being done? Oh, in could, I, I, I should could happen. Could happen. Phil, what do you should, what could you happen? The, the precedents are already being set. <clears throat> through the Istanbul process, yeah. A, which Hillary Clinton was an inaugural speaker at. The, the what process, sir? Istanbul process. Uh -huh. The second one indicator is UN Resolution 1618, which is patterned on blasphemy laws that are in place in various countries around the world, like Pakistan, that is up to and including a capital offense to criticize Islam. And have, uh, have groups like CARE conflated uh, Islamism as a political movement with Islam uh, to deflect criticism of Islamism? You notice they never discuss Sharia law. They always accuse Americans who are concerned about the nature of the threat as racist Islamophobes, but they never honestly address the actual teachings of the Quran or address the teachings of Sharia law. They always stay in a very small arena and repeat the same thing over and over again, that are Americans or racist Islamophobes, but never actually discuss the true teachings of Quranic Arabic and or Sharia law. They don't address it, because if they did, people would discover there's much more yeah. to it than what they're letting on. So, Mr. Gobriel, in, in, in summary, what, what would you uh, encourage 
uh, Americans to be thinking about vis-a-vis -vis the coming year. The, here we are in the, the beginning of autumn 2016. Uh, I believe, I believe, if Hillary Clinton win, the United States was not going to be United States anymore. It's going to be a weak country, and and it's going to go working with the Muslim countries and try to please them, and they're going to hire, I mean, not uh, uh, put on the Supreme Court liberal. We're going to lose our freedom here, and that's why I hope and my prayer that Trump will win because we already know. He's going to put, he already said about nine of them, Supreme Court, and all of them very conservative people. He's going to hire one of them. Next president is going to hire three, at least three Supreme Court. Uh -huh. Because two, one right now and two later, because very all, over like 70 or 80 years old, they're going to retire. So I hope, I hope that the Republican will win so they can put two or three Supreme Court conservative leader, conservative uh, judges. Thank you very much. <coughs> Gentlemen, uh, Phil, again, the, the name of your book in this, please. See something, say nothing. And uh, it, the author's name is? My name is Philip Haney. And is there a website that people, people can follow your you work on? You can find it on Amazon. I don't have any social media myself, but it's available on Amazon and several other common book sites. And there's a lot about me on social media. I just don't have my own website. Thank you for being with us today. Welcome. Thank you.